If an ant could walk from point A to point B on the donut, meaning the two were connected, it doesn't matter where point A ended up in the cup after we folded and so on, the ant could still or should still be able to walk from one point to another. If we make any cuts, we would create discontinuities that the ant now has to leap over. That's no good. Ants don't like leaping. <laughs> if we glue things, now we connect things that were disconnected before. So the ant now can walk to places they could not walk before. No good. Con connectivity needs to be preserved in topology. Now, getting back to the topological animal, or the topological vertebrate. The topological vertebrate need to be specified topologically because embryology, the process of converting a fertilized egg into an actual individual organism, a baby, is just a matter of topological transformations. It's stretchings, it's foldings, it's pocketings, it's invaginations. It's migrations of layers into layers, preserving continuities. And it is thanks to those series of operations that, a, that, a, that an egg of a giraffe can be stretched with the neck and stretched with the legs and become a giraffe. And the rhinoceros can become what it is. And the snake can lose the limbs and just become the, the pure body of the snake. In other words, the abstract, or rather the virtual topological vertebrate it's a topological entity, what, would he, what he would call a universal, uh, what he would call, I'm sorry, a virtual multiplicity. I'm going to explain the term in a second. It needs to be something so defined that by a set of transformations you can go from a giraffe to a rhinoceros, from a rhinoceros to a bat, to, from a bat to a whale. That's completely non-Aristotelian. But of course, it has precedence. Biologists in the 19th century were already discussing ideas like this. Geoffrey Saint Hilaire, I believe that's the way you pronounce it, Saint Hilaire, was already having big discussions with Cuvier, a very important a, a French anatomist in the beginning of the 19th century, over this precisely. Saint Hilaire claiming that all animal Creatures could be conceived without general categories just by showing what set of transformations converts one into the other. He was, of course, way ahead of his time because topology had not been invented and therefore he did not have the formal means to, 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 to say what he wanted to say. He did not have the formal means to specify what a body map is. Today, or a body plan, I'm sorry, a body plan, as it's also so called. How does this connect to universal singularities? Let me explain. First of all, how did topology get invented to begin with? If Kant and Hegel were celebrating Euclidean geometry as the crowning achievement of geometry, remember Euclidean geometry is based on the concepts of length, area, volume, whereas length, area, and volume doesn't exist in topology because something that was this length all of a sudden becomes this length, something that was this area all of a sudden becomes this area. Areas are not preserved under stretchings and foldings. Only connectivity is. So connectivity is a topological property, but it's not a Euclidean one. So how did we get from a century where every philosopher was singing the praises of a, of a geometry that was the final crowning achievement, there will never be anything after this, to a wild zoo of geometries, including topology? Well, the first step was this, and this is something that I already mentioned in another lecture. Hopefully, no one will mind. The two characters that are most important here, Gauss and Riemann. Gauss began by thinking, well, what happens if we take a two-dimensional piece of paper that's folded, nicely folded like I just did, how would you study that? Well, Euclidean geometry, particularly when combined with Cartesian coordinates, gives you an immediate response. Because if that is a two-dimensional plane, place it in a space that has one more dimension, in this case a three-dimensional space, draw the coordinates of that 
space, x, y, and z, then measure for every point of the surface how far away it is from the coordinates, and that's going to give you an x, y, and z address for that. It's, of course, based on lengths, the distance, the fixed distance that every point in the plane will have from the coordinates. Every point in this, in this, this space, this two-dimensional space, will be a set of points that is a set of x, y, and z values. People who use CAD software today, that is computer-aided design software, are familiar with this because we are all, every time you use that, you have to specify x, y, and z coordinates for anything. But Gauss thought, do we really need that extra space? Do we really need to embed that folded paper into a three-dimensional space in order to think about it? Why can't we use something more sophisticated, some piece of mathematics that's more sophisticated than Cartesian coordinates and Euclidean geometry? What, that, what would ma those mathematics be? Well, they're the mathematics invented by Newton and Leibniz, which got him into a huge fight which lasted for years because it was such an important piece of mathematics that they both wanted the credit for it. And since they co-invented it, there's absolutely no evidence that I know of anyway that one copied the other. So that's, an ama that's a singularity by itself, this moment of co-invention by two geniuses separated by a few miles of territory. The calculus, remember that in mathematics everything can be seen as something comes as an input, something goes as an output. So that if you have multiplication, you know, an operator from arithmetic, and you feed it two numbers, two and three, you get on the other side six. And so every operator in mathematics can be conceived as a black box. You don't even have to know how it works. All you have to know is what goes in and what comes out. If the, if the black box is addition, and you put a two and a five, on the other side you're expecting to get a seven. There are two numbers added. Well, the calculus is exactly the same. You can just black box it and forget about the technicalities. What does it get as an input? It gets anything that expresses a rate of change. That by itself is a beautiful notion because it's speed of becoming. It's about change. It's about becoming different. And it's about how, how fast or how slow are you becoming different. Of course, the most usual rate of change is rate of change of position. I had this position, and now I had this position relative to time. And that is going to give me the speed that I used to get from there to there. But velocity is not the only rate of change. You can, for instance, calculate the rate of change. You say, for instance, uh, 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 constructing a dam for a river. And of course, you know that the river will have more pressure at the bottom of the, of the dam than at the, at, the, at the top. And so what you want to know is what the rate of change of pressure relative to depth is always the speed or the rapidity or slowness with which something changes relative to something else. That's a rate of change. That goes as an input. Just any rate of change. And on the other side, we get as an output an instantaneous value for that rate of change. That is the rate of change at the most infinitesimal, teeny weeny little moment. Th say, for instance, that you're a forensic doctor and you have a corpse in your table here and he has a bullet hole in his head. And you want to know, where was the shooter? So one of the things you need to know is exactly at what speed was the bullet going right before it hit my head. Well, I mean, this guy's head. <laughs> that would be a useful, a funky, admittedly useful the calculus. Because if you know the brand of the gun, and you know the rough speed that the, that the bullet traversed, if you know the instantaneous speed that it had right before it hit you, right before the, the becoming wound started, then you got yourself something. So Gauss thought, why don't we use this mathematics? Why don't we have to be stuck with the mathematics of the old times? In particular, let's get rid of the silly things here. Consider this, the folded space by